Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Leah Wong, Vice President of External Relations with the Minneapolis Downtown Council. And we are delighted that you are joining us today as we talk about the downtown experience across the nation uh, and reconvening this group a year later. I just want to let everyone know that the program today is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. As we kick off the program, please feel free to introduce yourself uh, and your company in the chat if you would like to engage that way. And then also we will be taking Q&A at the end of the program. So our guests today will answer any questions that you have and we ask that you please put those in the Q&A uh, function. So if you do have a question, feel free to put that in the Q&A and we will uh, get to those at the end of the program. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our participants today. First, I would love to introduce Andrew Hone, who is the president and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance. Andrew grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and before joining the Portland Business Alliance, um, he was the president and CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce in New York. So Andrew, thank you so much for being here. Delighted to have you back in the conversation. Uh, next, I'd love to introduce Tammy Dorr, who is currently the, uh, making the transition as uh, CEO of Q Factor, a contemporary development firm in Denver. Uh, prior to this transition, uh, Tammy was the CEO of the Downtown Denver Partnership um, and joined there after serving as the Executive Vice President of uh, Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce. Tammy also has served as the chair of the International Downtown Association uh, Trade Organization for uh, Downtown. So Tammy, we are glad to have you back in the conversation. Thank you so much for being here today. And next, I'd love to introduce Steve Kramer, the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District. Um, I have the pleasure of, of working for Steve. And so we are excited uh, uh, to have him in the conversation today. Uh, Steve continues to be a, a dynamic leader for downtown Minneapolis, um, in addition to his uh, president and CEO role at the Minneapolis Downtown Council and DID. Uh, he uh, co-chairs the Heading Home Hennepin Executive Committee, um, is a Youth Link board chair, executive committee member of the Center for Transportation Studies, uh, and board member of numerous organizations, including the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce and Meet Minneapolis, um, and also serves on a uh, public safety committee with uh, the, that the mayor has formed. So Steve, uh, it is my pleasure to turn over the conversation to you, and we are all excited for the insights uh, that you and Tammy and Andrew will bring as we dive into conversations on downtowns across the country. So Steve, I will turn it to you and thank you so much for being here. Okay, Leah, thanks for that introduction. And uh, I would also extend my thanks to Tammy and Andrew for, for being here. I think where we wanted to start was just for each of us to take, uh, you know, five, seven minutes and provide a little bit of a update on kind of what's going on with our respective downtowns or just offer any any thoughts about kind of the, the journey that downtowns uh, across the country have been on and will continue to be on into, into next year. Uh, and then after that, facilitate a little bit of conversation between the three of us, but also for sure take on any questions that people who are tuned in uh, uh, this morning have as well. So with that, I think Andrew will start on the, on the West Coast and, and work our way towards the Midwest. So if you wouldn't mind uh, offering some of your reflections, that would be a great way to start. Thanks so much, Steve, and uh, to Tammy as well, and to the entire uh, downtown Minneapolis crew. Thanks so much for organizing this, to all the participants. So good to see you all again. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Time seems to just have no more meaning, uh, no meaning anymore uh, with uh, how fast it's been since our last conversation. A lot has obviously happened, uh, and uh, the greater Portland region uh, has been through a lot uh, of what you would call a marathon of crises, uh, downtown impacted the most distinctly. And just as a reminder, we're both the regional chamber of commerce as well as the downtown enhanced service district, which is the same thing as a business improvement district. Uh, just a rose by any other name still smells as sweet, I suppose. And so uh, we're responsible for the 213 blocks of the center city uh, that comprise the, the really distinct downtown core. 
Uh, and it's been a year, uh, to say the least, obviously impacted no differently by the outbreak of variants of the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, that has forestalled sort of grand reopenings or office return to work plans, which of course, naturally, just like any downtown across the country, are the, the lifeblood of the ecosystem drivers of the retail experience. So we continue to ride that wave, uh, just like any other place. Uh, Portland in particular, as, as no secret to any of you, uh, has had an enormous challenge uh, with the political violence that has permeated our downtown, continues to cause reputational brand damage uh, that continues to spring up from time to time uh, compared to last year at this time, enormously different. So we've had a, a wide uh, a, a overall reduction in political violence on our street. And that of course is good for business <laughs> to say the least. I, I, it shouldn't be, I shouldn't even have to be saying that, but it is a huge driver of the damage that has happened to our reputation across the nation. Uh, and so that has certainly gone down. However, we faced some of the worst and most historic ice storms that have ever hit the state of Oregon, historic wildfires that caused a almost week long, complete shutdown of all outdoor activity. As many of you know, we also have the most stringent COVID-19 mask mandates. We actually just relieved our outdoor mask mandate uh, about a week ago. So this, this state has a lot of layering of challenges on top of the things that most places are facing. And then of course, simultaneously seeing a massive increase in crime, uh, both violent and property damage is sort of innumerable challenge. And yet at the same time, I have to say the resiliency of the region's economy has been quite impressive. We are adding our sixth congressional district, which actually is reflective of the population growth of this region, uh, highly predicated here in downtown, concentrated in downtown or the greater downtown core of Portland. So you can continue to see very positive demographic growth, business growth as well. Uh, the state's revenue driven largely by income and corporate taxes has never seen um, a higher adjusted revenue stream, including some of the federal interventions that came about last year. So overall, the economy is highly stable. It's in a growth mode again. The inhibitors for growth are the same things that are the inhibitors of growth, I'm sure for all of you, which is broadly the labor market at this point and the ability to att attract and retain talent has been a massive challenge for especially event venues, retail, restaurant growth, uh, that uh, remains a high inhibitor for growth. And so we're, we're coming out of a really challenging period of time based on really distinct crises that we faced in our region. And yet the downtown core is stabilized and in a relative growth mode versus where we were last year at this exact same time. So we're actually a little bit more bullish than I was before. However, we still face challenges, particularly around safety. Uh, and of course, here on the West Coast, uh, the humanitarian crisis that you can see on the streets, the visible reflection of homelessness uh, is heart-wrenching and is also a mat, it's both a humanitarian crisis as well as a clear challenge to economic growth, business vitality, and, and also just tragic. So. Those are, that's where we're at right now and um, still very upbeat on Portland and, and pleased to be here. So that's that's what's going on in our neck of the woods. Andrew, thanks. That's a great way to kick off and, and thanks for that uh, kind of realistic but optimistic view. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, I think I just stole uh, Tammy's uh, uh, watchwords there, but Tammy Dore has been just an incredible leader, not only for Denver and before that Detroit, but just for the industry generally of kind of downtown associations and now is making an exciting transition into uh, into a new new venture. So Tammy, look forward to your comments about kind of all of that. And uh, uh, then we'll get back into some conversation after I give a little bit of an update about Minneapolis. So take it away, Tammy. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to be here. Actually wish I was in Minneapolis. It's a beautiful city and you all should be very, very proud of where you're at um, and your future. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we're experiencing in Denver, but also because, especially in my new role, I am working on development projects in many cities throughout the country. One thing I'll, set it up, I'll start off with by saying is that we are hearing across cities that this remote work issue is going to have a dramatic economic impact. I will tell you, I don't buy in. I do not believe wholeheartedly that we are going to have such a massive shift 
in terms of what's going to happen with people working in and out of offices. Yes, I do believe there will be a shift. We're seeing some of that now. In three months, that's going to stabilize a bit. Um, we, as downtowns across the country have been experiencing right now, foot traffic is down about 38%, but in August, it was down 45%. And that increase of foot traffic is largely attributed to people coming back to their offices. In Denver, we're seeing a large number of corporate headquarters out of the West Coast expanding to secondary headquarters in Denver. They're taking a lot of office space and they are saying right up front, our teams aren't back yet, but let us assure you that will be our expectation. That's our culture. So we're seeing some of that in Denver, although slow. I think that it's a 36 month window. I've made a major shift to go into office development because I believe that when people are looking left, you need to look right. And I think that um, our history has shown that people gather in cities and they gather together to collaborate, create and grow and office spaces are just microcosms of that. So that's what we're seeing in Denver around office space. The second thing is absolutely to build on what Andrew said, crime. Crime is up in nearly every neighborhood in our city. And of course, those crimes vary by neighborhood, but here's the reality. In our cities across the country, we are reflecting the crime issues in our center cities and downtown. And I think we're mistaken in that focus because when the entire city understands that crime is affecting every single neighborhood, those dialogues around policing and public safety and public policy can begin to change. It's just that it visibly manifests itself in our center city. And so one of the things we're working on is making sure that businesses re-engage in local politics. You all um, may remember, you know, or recall decades ago, business leaders were deeply engaged in local politics. They were the face of local politics. Through the years, and, and also I think through some sensitivities on CEOs' parts, they, they don't wanna tell their employees what they think about policy or how to vote. I believe across the country and in our center cities, we need a major call to action to business leaders to stand up for what they believe and call upon their employees to vote in those ways that will drive and support business and in turn support their job. And I think that that's another big focus we have here in Denver. Baby boomers are moving here in mass. We're working to understand how to leverage that economic demographic. But I think that all cities are experiencing that as well. The beautiful thing is, is that the new workforce and baby boomers all want the same thing. Walkability, bikeability, access to great venues, opportunities, culture, and so building that can bookend our economic impacts in our center cities. Beautification and park spaces are critical and we are focusing on that in Denver, but I'm seeing that across the country. This is the time to invest in infrastructure. We are redesigning park spaces, creating park spaces, investing in their management and building an urban forest. Um, that's in Denver. And in Denver, we just passed another bond project, um, um, actually an array of bond projects. Denver has been very good for the last 50 years of investing 10 to 15 years out. So we've hit these really rough patches economically, but we've always had these major infrastructure projects in the works. We always have one envisioned, one that we're seeking funding for, and one that we're implementing. And that's really helped us stabilize through uh, various recessions through time. And when you look at the more successful cities in the country, I think you're seeing that as well. And finally, I want to address two other things, just affordability. Denver is getting very expensive. We are struggling with how do we leverage affordability without defining the market and, and um, disincentivizing developers to build the kind of housing we need. And then I'll also just add that encampments are a very big deal in Denver. We do have a camping ban that is enforced as best as possible given the laws. 
I will not call these homeless camps. I refuse to say that everybody out there is homeless. In fact, our data is showing that every night we have empty beds in our shelters and our encampments get larger. We have an issue of crime in these encampments and it must be resolved. Um, and we are seeking best practices from cities across the country. With all of that said, we're still attracting the future workforce. They still want to live here and come here. They're willing to take lower wages and higher housing prices just to be in Denver. And that is around our mantra, I believe. If we built it, they will come and that's what we've been seeing. Great, Cami. thanks so much. I'm really looking forward to exploring some of the issues that you and Andrew have, have raised here. But let me just take a couple of minutes to provide a bit of an update about Minneapolis, and, and I think most of the folks on the call are from, from our city, so they'll this will be familiar territory. Um, but certainly, if I think back to the conversation we had a year ago, kind of looking forward into 21, certainly expected, kind of positive momentum, a positive trajectory overall. And on, on balance, certainly that has, has occurred for, for our city. Although along the way, kind of many, many ups and downs, it hasn't been just sort of a straight line uh, trajectory by, by any means. Um, so I think about you know, the biggest notable difference between last year and this, uh, between 2020 and this past year, I think the fact that kind of large events came back and really helped animate our downtown was, was just a huge factor. I mean, starting with, you know, Major League Baseball coming back, I know that's something Tammy, that the Denver and Minneapolis here have got the Rockies, we've got the Twins. Limited attendance at the beginning, but by the end, you know, they were able to fill target field if the fans were willing to go and see, you know, not that great baseball this season. Uh, but along the way, live entertainment, live music, some of our great clubs uh, were able to, to welcome uh, patrons back. Uh, uh, Broadway is back, uh, orchestra is back. Uh, you know, all those sorts of things that you could only do in downtown really draw, drew people back. And that was, was, was huge for, huge for us. And it, it was kind of a, a toe on the water opportunity too, for people that maybe had some concerns about coming back into downtown, you know, hadn't been here for a while, you know, heard a lot about public safety, which we've all talked about, or I will talk about making all of us. Uh, and should I go back down or not? So that first Twins game, that first Broadway show, good experience, you know, it kind of begins to chip away a little bit at, at those negative perceptions. So that that was huge. You know, our office worker return has has been slow but steady over this 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 year, and we are certainly seeing some of the diversity of opinions within employers that that both Tammy and, and Andrew have talked about. Some are are pretty bullish on having their people back at least you know three days a week, maybe more. Others that have more concerns about retaining a, maybe a high tech workforce are a little more flexible about their approach to their to their workers. So we're sitting now at about forty percent occupancy uh, uh, compared to you know five percent maybe when the stay at home orders in Minnesota hit in May uh, in uh, March of, of twenty twenty. So steady progress. We do we thought we saw an inflection point in September. Delta knocked that out. We think we'll see one in, 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 in January. Hopefully Omicron won't knock that one out either because having those workers back is just central to the vitality and, and economy of, of downtown as, as we've all said. Our residential population is strong. You know, it softened certainly during 2020, but it, even by this time last year, it was beginning to strengthen. Occupancy rates are up. Uh, the development pipeline is, is strong. So that part of our downtown, uh, which we've really focused on as an organization, continues to service in, in, in good stead and we hope to see continued growth in the downtown residential population. You know, all of that, all of that was affected by the safety issues that, that you've both, both raised. And we certainly had uh, a challenge here. You know, Minneapolis was the home of the defund movement in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And that has impacted our politics for the last 18 months. It's also impacted our police department and our department is down by a third. And so just the, the, the person power available uh, through, through uh, the Minneapolis Police Department isn't adequate to do the job that they need to need to do. So we have, both have to build that department back and we have to build it back better because some of the issues that were um, obvious through that tragic event on Memorial Day of 2020 need to be more effectively addressed than they have been in the past. It also influenced our, our most recent municipal election, which was really organized around the public safety question and uh, a proposition that basically would have eliminated the Minneapolis Police Department as a charter department 
in, in our in our city's charter and eliminated the office of police of chief of police. It's really driven by kind of an abolitionist philosophy. Uh, uh, and ultimately our voters said, you know what, that's not the vision that we have. We want a better police department, but we want a police department. And so that the, that uh, charter amendment was 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 turned away. Uh, we also strengthened the office of the mayor from a governance standpoint, which we think will be helpful. First time ever that that's happened. Even Hubert Hufford couldn't make that happen. So uh, that was kind of an amazing outcome for our election that we think will, will stand us in, in good stead. And then finally, just a couple of recent good events. We did have a Fortune 1000 company move in from a suburban location. So I can't, we can't rival Denver in terms of companies moving in, but we did have one and they're happy as, as they can be in, in downtown and their workforce has made the transition effectively. Um, our major department store, the last one closed a couple of years ago, but it reopened recently as a multi-use building with kind of retail, pop-up retail on the first floor that's drawn all kinds of crowds back into downtown for a retail experience, which is which is great. And, and our first office tenant in the office part of that building as well, the old Dayton's department store is now open as the Dayton's project. And last, but certainly not least, and I'm quite sure I wouldn't have highlighted this pre-COVID, but I'm gonna highlight it now, three straight days of Bachelorette featuring Minneapolis. I don't watch that show, but I know that it really helped to uh, provide a different image for Minneapolis and we sure needed it after kind of what we've been through over the last 18 months. So thank you, thank you Bachelorette. Um, well, with that summary, I, I'd like to go back to a question uh, that kind of combined issues that, that Tammy and Andrew raised. And Tammy, you made the point that historically, at least in, in, the, in the past, some number of, of years ago, the business community would be involved in politics. And, and we got really involved this year because we felt we needed to. It's kind of existential, some of the issues that were on the ballot and some of the candidates that, that needed to retire from public service and be substituted by folks that I think can do a better job for our city. And Andrew, you've, you've mentioned, and, and we feel some kinship with you, kind of the impact of, of this kind of far left, almost nihilistic, politics that that can kind of find its its, its expression in, in violence and 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 unrest in downtown so kind of how do we marry those two things how, do, how does the business community kind of get involved effectively to try to set our cities on the right course in in the in light of, of that that kind of trend that are affecting cities like portland and minneapolis and seattle and, and others probably all cities to some degree just kind of a, a, a variance of degree any thoughts on that well, sure, I can uh, let me pop in here. Um, yeah, please. I'd, I'd love to give a little um, contextualization. So similar, similar to I'm sure everybody, last November's general election was was massive, obviously because of a federal um, a presidential election clearly was driving a lot of the politics. In fact, locally, and again, this is not who you like or who you don't like, President Trump made Portland a actual campaign issue, right, where if you want the world to be like Portland, then you vote for Joe Biden. And that, that had resonance um, nationally for his constituency. And then locally, of course, it had you know, consequences to the reaction to that. And also going back to brand, we were in the middle of a historic election for ourselves. And this will seem a little odd to a lot of you, but it give you a little under the hood look of the way that the Portland city government works. And you mentioned form and function. So we have only five city council members, including the mayor, and we operate on what's known as a commission form of government. So this will sound strange to a lot of people, but when you get elected to be a city council member here in Portland, you are assigned executive authority over city agencies. So for example, a local council member can also it automatically in some ways become say, the commissioner of the Department of Transportation. So they're both CEO and legislature. We have an extraordinarily weak mayor system. There, in fact, I would frankly say it's a five mayor system. There is no true mayor. And we have not had a two term mayor since 1999. So we were in the process of reelecting a extraordinarily unpopular mayor in, in, in Ted Wheeler, who many people think is, you know, uh, in his own right, uh, an extreme left wing candidate or, or sort of extreme left uh, mayor. His challenger in the general election was an avowed uh, 
anarchist Antifa um, adherent who uh, deprived him of the plurality or the majority he needed in, in the May primary last year. Her politics, the, the word left and right don't apply anymore. They just go off the script. And so as a business community, we made the decision to stand up an independent expenditure, raised an enormous sum of, sum of money, and did it in coalition with the AFL-CIO, with local SCIU chapter, with environmentalists, with racial equity groups. So we formed a broad-based independent expenditure, stood it up, financed it, and were able to get messaging out that swung the election from the present mayor being 16 points down to winning by seven points. And, and we believe strongly that that intervention uh, was needed and extraordinary. And I would say that you don't deploy that sort of political activity regularly, but to Tammy's observations before, there are times and places when it is existential in nature to intervene in elections and to engage your broad base of employers to swing elections when you have sort of threats like this. And so we were successful in that, and that's borne out extraordinarily positive dividends over the year, the stability of having a two-term mayor. Also with that mayor brought up a series of pragmatic centrist Democrats into the city council and sort of stabilize the government here enough where we're actually making really, really sensible, pragmatic decisions on governance. And so the politics here as sort of right size in a really thoughtful way. Uh, and most recently we've come into sort of an historic level of revenue for the city uh, based on business success here. And ultimately the investments that were made most recently in a major budget uh, initiative uh, were really on the things we're just all talking about here, uh, public safety, uh, cleanliness, homelessness, uh, making those sensible investments that will pay the long-term dividends of getting the city back on a, a, a track and, and recommitting to basic services, which I think so many cities lost their grip on over the course of the pandemic. So I'm actually quite bullish and, and really just would reiterate to everybody that that elections matter, have consequences. And when you elect pragmatists, they deliver pragmatic solutions to the city. And I would say also this trend is really broad base. So if you look up to Seattle, who we oftentimes, the Pacific Northwest has, I think, a cultural identity that's very similar. They just had a recent mayoral election and they returned, a can again, a Democratic candidate who is pro-public safety, pro-basic services, pragmatic leadership. You're seeing that trend and it is so important for downtowns and the vibrancy of downtowns to have that commitment of basic services because it's the predictability that all of us look for. So I think trend-wise on politics, everything is pointing in the right direction. We just have had a really sloppy couple of years where we've just ended up in a really tight situation for how we've been governing our cities. And um, actually we're in the process of this upcoming November, rewriting the entire charter for the city of Portland because it has become so obvious that our form of government has, has inhibited any common sense approach to how to deliver the city services we all depend on. So we're in the same process and we'll look back towards Minneapolis and your successes on how do we write our own ship here because we have a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's encouraging though. Tanya, what, what more would you say about this topic that, that you kind of raised for us? Well, I, I can't emphasize enough the point about CEOs and business leaders having a point of view and sharing it, even if they feel that some of their employees will not appreciate that their CEO is um, advocating to their own colleagues and team members around positions. It's imperative. Uh, policies have long lasting effects. Some are felt decades later. Second thing I would say is that in looking at policy, the business community and or let's call it the establishment tends to focus on fighting bad policy when it's presented. We tend to focus on um, proposing exciting, innovative new ideas and advocating for those types of policies. There needs to be a fundamental shift in that approach, which strategically also begins to look at all the policies that are currently in place. The point about revisiting the charter is a great example, but I would take it even to a more micro level. This is what the far left is really good at, going back into the bucket of policies pulling them back out, tearing them apart, and rewriting them. Business um, and the private sector have the power to do that as well. So instead of just trying to rebuild policy for the future, 
try to deconstruct those parts of policy that don't currently work in the legislative framework in our municipalities. And I'll emphasize municipalities because I do believe in most structures, um, truly, the impacts come from cities. Thank you. You know, another another thing we all hold in common, and Tammy, you mentioned the you know your experience with the camping ordinance in in Denver several years ago. Andrew, you mentioned the you know the the the, the, the human tragedy of, of of homelessness on the West Coast that also has business impacts, and we're certainly seeing that as a growing issue even even in Minnesota. I think uh, global climate change is having an impact there because it's like 45 degrees out here today and normally it would be maybe 30 degrees colder than that having an impact on that issue and so we're seeing it more as a year-round issue now um kind of where, where are we headed as cities on on this on this question i mean the 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 disparity of of of, of wealth in our society helps drive this along with you know addiction and 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 other kind of uh uh, personal maladies that that folks experience, um, and so there's a compassionate response, but there's also a business impact from from encampments and and invisible poverty in our downtown. So, kind of, what's the path forward for from your perspectives on on this issue? Because it's not it's not going away. Tammy, yeah. you start with Go that. Ahead, Tammy. Uh, uh, yeah, you really oh. you really dealt with that five years ago. I know it was a huge well, issue for Denver and for you personally. I know it really was was stressful. Yes, because um, I led the initiative to write our camping ban in our city, which basically said that if there's a place for you to go, you can't sleep on the street. If there's no place for you to go and we can't get you there, then you may sleep, you know, on the street. But my belief was and still is that no society believes it's better for people to be outside sleeping on our streets. I also think that we have gotten very soft around the rhetoric around what encampments are. And if we were all to be very honest with what is actually happening in them, we will find a percentage of individuals that are truly homeless and suffering with mental health and addiction issues. We will find a massive number of individuals that have created a lifestyle that is driving crime in our city. And the challenge is, is that from a rhetoric standpoint, our society, we're very uncomfortable saying it. And, and the fact is that these are uh, den, uh, dens of crime. I mean, they really are. And we have to get it resolved because it's impacting the entire city. I think there need to be stricter policies. They need to be enforced more, not just in Denver, but in all of our major cities throughout the country. Um, we need more support from the federal government to address mental health. You know, that used to be a burden borne by our federal government, and that's all been pushed to the municipal level. And I think that's a place that the private sector can play a big role in going back and really calling for the federal government to get back in the game. Um, short of that, I do believe it's enforcement. I can't speak for your respective cities, but when I say that we have empty shelter beds, and people on the street, that's just an enforcement issue at some point. Yeah, actually, I want to talk a little bit about where we're at because there's what, what Tammy's referencing is interesting because it was really um, at the vanguard of what the West has experienced as a result of a landmark ruling by the Ninth Circuit Court uh, known as Martin v. Boise. And in effect, and there's not been a lot of follow-up casework on this. In fact, there was a ask to the Supreme Court to overrule the, the, the ruling. Uh, however, the, the premise of it is that if you um, don't have a place to send a person or an available safe drive facility, you cannot move them or you can't enforce local sidewalk ordinances. And the West in particular uh, is there's a massive delta between the overall population that's on the street, unsheltered homelessness, and available beds. In fact, um, Oregon is either number one, two, or three in the nation consistently when it comes to the HUD point in time count. And this is also equal to downtown and, and uh, Portland in general, of having the largest proportionate share of their homeless population being unsheltered. And frankly, it's because it's a newer part of the nation we we're not established and have not built the infrastructure to actually shelter people. We're in a rapid phase of expanding sheltering right now. And in fact, we feel 
that at this point, because of statutes passed by the Oregon legislature in the last legislative session in 2020, excuse me, this year in 2021, that we are here compliant with Martin v. Boise. So we're going to start to test the case itself to say, if you have a safe, dry place to go, then you have to go, or we can enforce our sidewalk ordinances, similar to what Denver's doing. That being, and on top of all of this, we pass a mass of the largest per capita expenditure on homelessness services uh, in the nation last year that just took effect on July 1st. So we have the layering of the legal element of the Ninth Circuit Court, definitions by the state of Oregon about what that means for local municipalities, the resources and rapid expansion of shelter services, we now are positioned and in a place to rapidly expand and be able to start to enforce our sidewalk ordinances and totally agree, any common sense person, it is better to be in a shelter than it is to be on the street. And we should reject any sort of notion that being on the street's better. And this is the top issue for voters in the state and in the region. And so this is driving decision-making at all levels at this point. It is, and I've been seeing polling in you know, my career for 20 years now. I have never seen a more ascendant issue that matches what business leaders are interested in and what we know is impacting the downtown viability. And so it's the confluence of all this stuff, frankly, that is leading to a much better outcome where we're starting to move people more rapidly off the street and into sheltering services and so I'm hopeful for it, but I just would add that this is the issue, and Tammy is right, it's just been a real gulf between common sense, practical, and honest conversations around what is causing the challenges, what the solutions are, and getting to those spaces. But I think we're in the right direction now because it, it's just gotten so bad yeah. um, and so tragic that we've had to turn a corner or else we would have frayed at the seams as a society here, frankly. Yeah. Well, yeah. and on that point, so I did work as well on that um, Supreme Court case. Um, we were pretty actively involved on that effort, but we um, we're seeing here a couple of years ago there was a major effort to go to the voters to overturn our camping ban. And when you actually brought voters into focus groups, when they were around other people, they used all the rhetoric about oh you know, it would be cruel to make somebody move. When you got them alone, they were like, yeah, well, it's fine if it's downtown. It, you know, if I don't see it from my office or my home, well, then those encampments begin to spread into neighborhoods. And when that got distributed throughout our city, the voters went crazy. And when this ballot initiative went forward to overturn our camping ban, it actually lost by a record number of voters mm. in the last several decades of any election. So I think it does go to show that there's an empathy from our residents to a point, but they're not stupid. They get bad behavior and they can differentiate that from those in need and just bad behavior. And we just all have to be a little bolder and not afraid to be judged by saying that. Um, yeah. Back to the pragmatic earlier point. Yeah, certainly for, for us, this issue has, as I said earlier, become more and more prominent. And, and there, you know, this is, as your, your communities are, this is a caring community. We want folks that, that, that have challenges in life to have the resources they need to kind of move forward in a positive way. But then that is mixed in with other other activities that that you know are less uh, less defensible, and it becomes part of a continuum of safety issues as well. Sort of the livability factor of our downtown, kind of intersecting with a less active downtown over the last year or so. It just really kind of raised the profile of, of all those questions. And and to your point, Andrew, really did become a kind of a business retention, business recruiting. Uh, factor more so than ever ever before so hopefully we're all on the right right path to find the right solutions for those individuals that need help but also for our for our downtown business environment and the environment for people who want to visit and enjoy our our cities um let me shift focus a little bit and maybe kind of look look to the future uh tammy when we were visiting yesterday you were talking a little bit about uh kind of secondary cities and and how how as we come out of 
of COVID and, and transition into whatever that next uh, phase of, of downtowns for larger communities like ours is, that we should pay attention to that as well. Do you want to comment on that or anything else about kind of what downtowns face in future years as we kind of move through the, the COVID pandemic phase, maybe into the COVID endemic phase? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, humans by their very nature have the um, natural inclination, inclination to believe that that which is happening now is going to happen for perpetuity. And what I'm consistently cautioning both business and the way we develop our center cities that this isn't the case. Um, this is a once in a multi-generation situation with the pandemic. We need to keep on keeping on doing what we're doing and that within 36 months, we should be pretty solidly back if we continue to invest in our center cities. But we do have some risk and uh, certainly affordability is one of them, which actually I find interesting with the crime issues. We say that people don't wanna to move to center cities because of the crime issues and yet housing prices are going up because the market is calling for it. But these secondary cities that are just under the radar of our bigger um, cities in our metropolitan areas, are going to be important competition because they are more nimble. They've learned from what's happening at big cities. They're grasping and getting some of the businesses and residents that maybe are moving out of urban centers. So they've learned and watched what is working, what is not, and they can move a little faster. They're also not fraught with many of the social issues that are being faced in the just slightly larger cities. So larger cities really need to make sure that they're focused on things like beautification, clean and safe. I mean, these seem like such simple things, but the reality, this is what the smaller cities are able to do so well because they haven't borne the burden of these other, these other factors around crime and cleanliness. And also, how do you leverage and create events that can only be held in an urban center and authentically tell the story of that urban center? Secondary cities don't have as much of that uh, history built up to be able to leverage those stories and their events and public activations. And those to me are some of the biggest things that cities can do. But at the very core, if you don't get clean and safe right, nothing else is going to work. Yeah, thanks. And what's the future look like for you? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really good point. You know, I, it's funny. I, I came out of you know, New York City where, where, and I worked in Brooklyn for two decades and there was always this, ah, oh, we got to beat Manhattan and, you know, Manhattanites looking at us and saying, oh, whatever, you know, who are you? <laughs> you know, so there's always this, and people may not appreciate that coming from Minneapolis or Denver, or wherever, but, you know, there is that sort of sense of, you know, uh, regionalism or parochialism and um, similar is true here. Uh, you know, we have 2.7 million people in the, the greater metropolitan you know, economic district. And it stretches across the Columbia River into Southwest Washington, where the city of Vancouver, not Vancouver, British Columbia, but Vancouver, Washington, uh, is located booming secondary city. You go out to Hillsboro or Beaverton, which is, you know, uh, straight towards the ocean here. That's the headquarters of Nike. It's where a massive Intel factory is located. You know, so what we've seen is similarly this just complete upswelling of these, these new cities I actually view it overall as a positive, and we have a regional coordinated economic development strategy. And as a regional chamber of commerce, I'm very excited to see that development happening because at the end of the day, it is good for everyone. And, we, and there used to be sort of internecine battles between these cities where, you know, Vancouver would send recruiting information to downtown Portland businesses. And uh, so there, there was a little bit of a competition that, that, is, that is totally accurate. I think no one can deny that the health of a downtown is key to that overall economic development strategy. So what's good for one is good for the other. So we need healthy and vibrant downtown cores. And similarly, it's actually exciting to see the development of these secondary cities. I will agree totally with Tammy that we, we won't see a widespread abandonment of our center cities. That's just, we've all learned that's not reality, but we are gonna see repositioning. We're, we're actually active similarly with all of our colleagues across the country on the um, Revitalizing Downtown Act, which is just one more toolkit, but it's about repositioning commercial office buildings to be residential. Obviously the switchover would be massive. Those in the development community know the expense and why 
commercial buildings are designed one way, residential another. So there's huge implications for that. But this has that intersectionality of the housing crisis that we're all sort of in right now, what's driving homelessness in general, and the affordability and attractiveness of center cities. So you see this sort of repositioning of downtowns that might be different than it was before, but still vibrant, maybe with a higher you know, residential population than before and a bigger focus on that because of how much we're using commercial office space in, in a different capacity. So I, I'm really excited about the development of these sort of outer ring cities around Portland because simultaneously we're seeing a continued vibrancy here in our downtown. So I think it's it's a, a positive trend overall, but I think it's a good point. It's always nice to have a little competition to spur development and uh, we're seeing that here in the Portland region. There is no parochialism in the Twin Cities. I have I have heard of this <laughs> verb called St. Paul. Some people seem to talk about that every once in a while, but there's no parochialism here at all. So <laughs> we did we did have one question, maybe going back to the social conditions issue, more specifically on the question of of panhandling, and and I know that's also been a little bit of a vexing issue in terms of the ability to enforce or the willingness to enforce any insights from your experiencing experience around that kind of on street level solicitation of, of people and how your communities are handling that? So we wrote a panhandling ordinance several years ago that limited where you could panhandle. You could not panhandle in any place a person couldn't get away, meaning ATM machine over a patio, cafe from a curb to a car. Um, obviously, this is tough to enforce. But one thing that we, we did do is we did a, a very large uh, study. It in, involved um, email surveys, phone calls, interviewing residents to ask about how much money they give to panhandlers a year and why they gave that money. Mm -hmm. And the amount was you know, in the $7 million range at mm -hmm. the time when you added it up. And when we asked them why, they said either they were afraid and felt threatened and they needed to do it. Um, they were with somebody who they wanted to impress that they were a good person, mm. right? You're, you don't want to look like the bad guy sure. that doesn't give the money or you, you truly feel you're making a difference. We were able to also interview people who panhandled and ask them what they were doing with the money. And then we did a huge campaign to educate people and then redirect their money to services. We actually had a very dramatic impact in a reduction in panhandling because we were drying up their resource and an increase to services. We did that for a few years and was successful, but we, we just didn't keep it up. But panhandling, although tough here, is not as bad as it was when we initially started that particular initiative. Uh, similarly, out, out of the Denver playbook, probably five years ago, the chamber stood up a significant campaign around panhandling about what it is, the impacts of it, and, and what actually happens to those dollars and how to divert those resources to service providers that have clinical expertise that are able to do the actual interventions that we know produce positive outcomes. And similarly, we're able to enact some level of constraint around the ability to panhandle here. So it translated both into a public awareness campaign as well as into local ordinance, local law. And we've seen a dramatic decrease in that sort of activity and, and obviously um, a positive increase to service providers. So I think it, it's actually incumbent on the business community to make that, that concerted effort because I think you want to see the resources diverted, not diverted, but going directly to those who do the actual um, work we want to see happen in homeless services in general. So, um, and, and yeah, it's not, it's not perfect by any means. So of course you're going to see people asking for resources, but it, it has dramatically changed here in the landscape of what is the driving issue. It's more about the encampments that we see around the city and that sort of well, drug use or condition. It does build on that whole perception of safety and discomfort. And crime obviously is a major issue in our cities, but sooner or later that will get brought back under control. When foot traffic increases, more eyes and ears on the street, when some of the funding is restored, in particular cities around policing, et cetera. Challenges is you have a tail that extends pretty far out on all of this, and that's the perception of safety. It's how do you feel um, now, and how long does it take to convince somebody 
that they don't need to feel that way? Um, or how long does it take them to come back after they've felt that way? And so we did do a study around building a city for women as an economic imperative. It's a really important kind of stake in the ground that we're working on. But in that, we looked at that feeling of safety and it is the number one driver for women making choices about living or working in a center city or visiting. And not to mention that if they are here for a conference or convention, if a woman goes in to her hotel two hours early because she doesn't feel safe, that's two hours less of spending that she may have done in a restaurant, a bar, um, a store. And so these have real economic impacts in terms of how people behave. Yeah. Yeah, in our, in our, you know, we have a pretty comprehensive reanimation campaign going on and includes quite a bit of research. And that is the one that, that's the, the demographic that is most, most concerned about coming back to, to downtown and try to be honest about the reality of safety issues. But that reality is surrounded, as you suggest, Tammy, by a huge perception issue that we just need to keep chipping away at so people have a realistic understanding of, of what the issues are and what they aren't. And that's going to be a continued challenge. Well, let me ask one last question, and then I'll turn it back to Leah to kind of wrap this up. Uh, if if the three of us were sitting here again in a year, uh, you know what what's uh, what's the story going to be for for Portland, Andrew? And then I'll ask uh, Tammy the same thing about Denver and other communities she's working in. Well, I think seeing a massive reduction in, in homeless encampments that would be hugely successful, and with the resources we have and the laws that are on the books right now, I think we'll be in that direction. Also, similarly, broad reopenings, uh, defeating the sort of broad pandemic-related issues, driving the, le the lack of office work. So seeing that return to office where you get that vitality back on the street. So I think that that is a similar situation here. For us here, uh, we have two of the largest infrastructure investments in the state's history within the city's uh, limits the I-5 Rose Quarter project, which is the intersection of 84, a little interstate you may be aware of, and then also I-5, which is the main north-south yeah. interstate here on the West Coast. So we're talking about almost you know $10 billion worth of investment in our communities right here. This will be transformative. And not only is it these broad, uh, so the I-5 bridge replacement, I should say, over the Columbia River, so not only are these important because they need the actual upgrades, they also include huge uh, public transit investments that link our downtown to communities across the region. And so um, I'm hopeful based on present trends that we will actually be very near the start of constructions, the ramp up, the engineering work, the remediation that happens for that. This will be huge for our region. It's, it's, it's just, there's no way to talk about the scale of that investment here. So I'm very hopeful that that will, will come sooner rather than later. And uh, we'll be talking positive economic data in the, in the year ahead. Good, good luck. We just finished a four year redo of Interstate 35W coming into downtown with a transit facility in the middle of it. And boy, am I glad it's over, but uh, you, you'll, you'll experience those impacts, but you'll be well served for decades by the, by the investment. So good luck. Tammy, what, uh, what do you forecast for the next year ahead? Well, continued focus on entrepreneurial uh, development in our city, attracting entrepreneurs, helping them launch and start, and keeping them here when they grow and scale. We have a lot of infrastructure dollars coming in through our bond projects, and we're going to be opening up the construction for the 16th Street Mall. <laughs> I know you guys have all been through yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. We... Uh, we break ground on that first quarter of 2022. That's completely funded and ready to go. Great. And then we have two parks that are going to be under redesign and redevelopment right in the core. And then the next step is thinking about the biggest and boldest next ideas. We've gotten through a lot, building out Union Station, expanding our fast track system here. So now we're in that phase where you begin to climb back up with some new projects. Continuing to focus on targeting talent to get here to support our growing companies. And um, I will just add in the, the other cities in which I'm working, really building out neighborhoods and creating that work life experience in those districts so you can leverage the flexibility that comes with 
um, the new work lifestyle, but still builds out a significant amount of office space. And we're looking in um, Sacramento, Bozeman, Salt Lake, and Detroit right now, we have projects going in, it's all office. Thank you so much. There were a couple of other questions and, and we will follow up with, uh, with, with folks uh, because there's some, some information that was requested and we'll make sure that gets out. But Andrew and Tammy, I just can't thank you enough for being a part of this again. A very interesting conversation, very hopeful conversation and uh, look forward to continuing to stay in touch. And Leah, let me turn it back to you to wrap us up. Thanks, Steve. Well, Tammy, Andrew, and Steve, I would just uh, echo, thank you so much. The conversation today was super insightful um, and covered many critical topics that I know people found value in uh, that joined today. So thanks so much for your time and for your insights and for the important work that you all are doing um, as leaders as we continue to reanimate and support downtowns across the country. So really appreciate that. Uh, just a reminder that we did record the program today and so it will be available via the YouTube page. Um, and then also just to encourage you all to follow along on the journey. Uh, you can follow along on the website or social media channels. I know some of the um, panelists today have included information in the chat on how to do that. Um, and you can follow us as well. So we would encourage you to do that. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you all downtown. <laughs>